on this edition of Expose, industry-funded front groups disguised as grassroots organizations on a mission to influence not just public opinion, but also public policy. A reporter uncovers the connections between big business, big money, and a climate of doubt. Funding for Expose has been provided by differences among scientists and there should be differences and science progresses by examining what these differences are and trying to figure out how to answer the question those differences raised but there are honest differences and there are dishonest differences in some ways there's real uncertainty and what I've called manufactured uncertainty there is an entire industry to create uncertainty to magnify it to manufacture it in order to slow down regulation that will protect the public's health or the environment there's a huge amount of distortion of science right now. It's not the job of scientists to come out and complain about distortion in science. That's the job of journalists is to step forward and say, this is what scientists are saying and this is being distorted. Crime, corruption, and scandals may be the staple of investigative journalism. But to this list must be added the innocuous sounding category known as product defense. I set the rules to protect the health of workers, the environment, and the communities around some of the nation's most polluted sites. I began to see this whole industry, the product defense industry, which exists really to create studies and to create the environment to convince people that certain hazards are not really hazardous. During his years in government, David Michaels witnessed corporate attacks on independent scientific research that threatened industry's bottom line. One of the earliest and most aggressive players in what came to be called product defense was big tobacco. Beginning in the 50s and continuing into the 90s, tobacco companies disputed scientific evidence about the dangers of smoking, hoping to sway public opinion and to slow government oversight. Documents have been discovered, usually in lawsuits, that show us people coming up with a plan saying, here's how we have to seed the literature to raise doubts. Companies faced with scientific evidence detrimental to their profits often hire product defense specialists to support research friendly to the industry, coordinate legal defense strategies, try to frame or reframe the public debate. When one fight is over, they move on to the next. Many of those same institutions that were working to undermine the science, to attack scientists, to create confusion, Ten years ago, those were some of the same think tanks, the same individuals that were creating confusion also about the dangers of secondhand smoke. They were doing this in the 90s. They're now doing this on global warming. My question is, what are they going to be doing ten years from now? In 2004, science writer Paul Thacker joined a peer-reviewed journal called Environmental Science and Technology, ESNT. Hired as a general reporter, he had no intention of investigating the product defense business or investigating anything until one day when he was doing some computer searches. It was a, like a Thursday afternoon and I wasn't really doing much and I was just kind of messing around on the internet and I went to this website of, this, of junkscience.com. Junkscience.com, Thacker found, claims to expose, quote, faulty scientific data and analysis used to advance special and often hidden agendas. But Thacker was soon to learn and inform his readers of the hidden agenda of the self-described junk man who runs the site, Stephen J. Malloy. Malloy identifies himself as the publisher of JunkScience.com and a columnist for FoxNews.com. But Thacker also noted that he'd been a judge for a top journalism prize. He had been a journalism judge for AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's the most prestigious science society in the world. And he was claiming he'd been a journalism judge. I thought it was a little odd. So I looked into his whole background, and he's worked for the tobacco companies. He's been a lobbyist for <clears throat> ExxonMobil. 
In 2005, Thacker wrote an article about Malloy in ES&T. In it, he cited evidence he found in the Legacy Tobacco Documents Library, an archive formed in the wake of the lawsuits against the largest tobacco companies. The archive showed that Malloy was president of a group calling itself the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, a nonprofit formed to promote so-called sound science and assist Philip Morris. The group evidence showed also took money from ExxonMobil. The group eventually was run out of Stephen J. Malloy's house, where IRS records showed it paid its sole employee, Malloy, $126,000 for 15 hours per week as president. An investigator was born, and now Paul Thacker wanted to know more. He plumbed the tobacco archive and found that Malloy had had a role in the debate over the health effects of secondhand smoke. And I was looking through a budget document for some scientists to see who their paid scientists were. And on page like 13 or 14, there was a line item. Stephen J. Malloy, $90,000 in fees, $2,500 in expenses. I was like, oh, this is good. Because people have been saying for a long time that he'd worked for, for, for uh, groups that were affiliated with the tobacco companies, that advocated for tobacco companies, but no one really had had the goods on him before to say he was paid by the tobacco companies. In a freelance piece for the New Republic, Thacker reported that Malloy was on Philip Morris's payroll when he wrote an article for FoxNews.com, attacking a study that found women living with smokers were at greater risk for lung cancer. Milloy also attacked EPA research that connected secondhand smoke with health risks. David Michaels, a source in Thacker's reporting, says that's exactly how product defense works. There is no debate in the scientific community virtually around um, the effects of secondhand smoke. But the tobacco industry tried to say that's junk science. The flip side of it is this idea that it's sound science, and you often hear corporations saying, we support regulation, but only regulation based on sound science. I think what they want is something that sounds like science, but isn't. The way a lot of these guys work is, is they push themselves as like, I'm a free market, I'm a libertarian kind of guy. You know, they're, you know, not necessarily I'm for this corporation, it's always, you know, it's free market. They tap into that aspect of the American psyche that does not like government. There's nothing wrong with working for a corporation. The problem is when people don't know where your money's coming from. If a corporation comes out and says something like, you know, regulations are bad or, um, you know, smoking is not bad for you, and it's a tobacco company, you kind of like look at it and you kind of laugh and you giggle and you sort of move on. Now, if it's some third party, then you kind of wonder, you know, well, you know, maybe this is, you know, a relevant opinion. You know, you don't know. I think most people who do investigative journalism, they, they tend to be sort of a blue-collar background. I don't know if that, how well that fits, but I think that's pretty true. So um, my dad uh, works construction, and so I really had no money to go to college, so I went to the military to get money for college. Then I moved out to California, and I enrolled at a community college and went to UC Davis. And um, I was in the college Republicans at the time. Um, that was fun. And uh, then when I graduated, I moved back to Atlanta, where my parents are, and um, was working in a lab for a few years, and then wanted to get into journalism. Thacker began looking for an internship. He found one in New York City with the Autobahn Society's magazine. To make ends meet, he waited tables and freelanced for publications like Discover and the Christian Science Monitor. His beat was always science, but that beat expanded when he moved to Washington. Everything here has a lot of politics and wrap, wrapped up in it, you know, and you're kind of, whether you want to or not, you get wrapped up in the politics a little bit. And you start to see <clears throat> how the game is played politically, you know, how the money is so important in this science. And I'd kind of been suspecting it for some time, but I really started noticing a lot when I moved here. Until Paul joined the staff, um, we had not done any investigative reporting. When he first did that, I said, that was great, it was wonderful, you know, we haven't gotten in too much trouble, um, but I really need a science reporter. Paul, please go back to being a science reporter. You know, my editor was not very enthusiastic about these stories. He wanted to do straight science stories. And what I sort of kept explaining to him over and over again, I think what he finally saw was the fact that 
us writing a story about this new research or us writing a story about what scientists are doing is not really that interesting. The next thing I know, he comes in with a new pitch for a, another article um, which requires him to do some investigative reporting. And it wasn't long before he's got two or three of them on his plate. Becker was on his way, searching documents and the internet, finding clues that revealed citizen groups that were not what they seemed. I do have to say, of the three stories that Paul did, um, The Hidden Ties is actually my favorite one. Um, Paul went into that story, and it's probably typical of an investigative report, not completely knowing what he was going to find, but his instincts, and, and he had did enough preliminary reporting to indicate there was something good there. Searching newspapers and the congressional record to learn about the Bush administration's proposed plan to change federal forestry laws, Thacker took note of what appeared to be an Oregon grassroots organization, calling itself Project Protect. You know, I found a letter to an editor that had been sent to a, a Reno paper back in 2003, and, you know, it was signed by a woman who worked at some group called Project Protect. Well, I looked them up, and um, they didn't seem to exist, and I found their old website. And once I realized this was a now defunct group, I realized, oh, this is an AstroTurf group. It's these phony groups set up by corporations designed to look like grassroots organizations. And once I found that, then everything came unraveled. And from there, I just started tracking everything. To learn more about Project Protect, Thacker used a website known as The Wayback Machine, which accesses seemingly extinct websites. He learned that back in 2003, Project Protect looked like a group of concerned citizens in Oregon supporting the so-called Healthy Forest Initiative. The group backed two of the proposed legislation's most controversial features. It would, as Thacker wrote, limit citizens' ability to appeal logging sales on federal lands and emphasize cutting trees to prevent fires. Thacker reported that Project Protect, it turned out, was run by a political operative with ties to the timber industry named Tim Wigley, and its tax records showed it had millions of dollars at its disposal to influence the debate. That story has an aha moment, and that's when we got the tax forms back. And it clearly showed that the um, groups behind the so-called environmental group was in fact the, the um, timber industry. I mean, it was clearly there. I mean, it's just one of those great moments that I went into Paul and I said, you just nailed this story. And so the way something like that works when you have a very coordinated multi-million dollar campaign, you as a person get something in the mail, maybe a television ad if they really want to spend some money. You're not going to know who this group is. You don't know who they are exactly. And they're going to appeal to things that you want, make something better, improve it, update it. You're not going to realize that something like Project Protect took in a lot of money from timber companies. That's who sat on the board. I would found out that the um, Project Protect had taken out full page ads in the Oregonian. I called up the Oregonian, found it out, found out, and I confirmed that this was the case and that they'd spent um, each, each one of these ads was $10,000. This was Project Protect. When President Bush signed the healthy forest legislation in 2003, Project Protect appeared to get its wish. The controversial provisions limiting citizens' rights and logging to prevent forest fires now became law. And Project Protect? The group disbanded. But the operatives behind it moved on. Thacker reported that Tim Wigley went from heading Project Protect to becoming the campaign director for another group purporting to be a grassroots organization, the Save Our Species Alliance, working to, quote, modernize the Endangered Species Act. So when I had some of this information in hand, I called up Tim Wigley to talk to him about the Endangered Species Act, you know, where it was at, what was going on with the Endangered Species Act in, con uh, in Congress. And then I started asking him questions about Project Protect. Did he also work on Project Protect? He said, oh, yes, that was a, a grassroots uh, movement made up of farmers, I think, uh, farmers and, 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 and loggers and, and uh, um, who else it was, you know, a grassroots group. I said, oh, where did the money come from, for that come from? Then he got very uncomfortable at that point in the conversation. And then I asked him, well, who paid for the website for the Save Our Species Alliance? 
Then he really wasn't happy. Mr. Thacker, I think you're being a little bit misleading in your questions this time. I don't know why you're asking these questions. And then after that, the conversation just degraded, and he eventually hung the phone up. To be honest, when I was looking to fill Paul's position, if he had approached me and said, I'm going to be an investigative reporter, I probably wouldn't have hired him. To Paul's credit, he really pushed us in that direction. Paul did a good sell on the stories that he had, and it was eventually, it was the quality of his pitches and the story ideas that sold me on moving that way. So eventually, over time, he started to see it himself, you know, that, yeah, this is important. And plus, the other thing, too, is we started to get a lot of real positive letters coming in from scientists, you know, saying this is really great journalism. What's happening right now in America is large corporations are able to spin the science uh, to their benefit, to cut down on regulations, to confuse the public so that the public is not outraged when something is dangerous. Paul's work is important because, as a rule of thumb, we give scientists the benefit of the doubt. When we read a study, we think, well, I'm sure it's being done by an honest scientist. It's probably right, or at least they mean it to be right. And so every example is new and important. And when he's able to show through finding documents that this, these sets of studies were really set up by a corporation to protect itself, it says not that all science is bad or that you know, scientists are not credible, but in this particular area, these studies were really invented to manufacture uncertainty and to slow down public health protections. Every one of Paul's stories scared me. But probably the story I, I lost most sleep about was the Weinberg report. The Weinberg Group is an international product defense firm headquartered in Washington, D.C., which has worked on industry's behalf fighting off health claims on products from tobacco to Agent Orange. Acting on a tip, Thacker investigated EPA documents and wrote a story revealing exactly how product defense strategy works. In it, he showed how Weinberg offered to help out chemical giant DuPont when the company faced potentially enormous liability for the possible health effects of a chemical used to make Teflon, called PFOA. Thacker had unearthed a letter from Weinberg to DuPont, which read, DuPont must shape the debate at all levels. We must implement a strategy which discourages governmental agencies, the plaintiff's bar, and misguided environmental groups from pursuing this matter any further. The letter went on to propose that Weinberg develop blue ribbon panels of thought leaders to create awareness of safety regarding PFOA in areas of likely litigation. Begin to identify and retain leading scientists to develop a premium expert panel and concurrently conflict out experts from consulting with plaintiffs. And coordinate the publishing of white papers on PFOA, junk science, and the limits of medical monitoring. A DuPont spokesperson wrote Thacker, confirmed that the company hired the Weinberg Group. Thacker couldn't confirm. The company went through with all the suggestions in the letter. We were messing around in topics that really involved big time companies and that the potential for reverberations on that one was probably the greatest. The cumulative effect of Thacker's reporting, he says, caused reverberations among his bosses at the American Chemical Society, the professional organization that publishes environmental science and technology. I started getting signals that there was something wrong with my journalism, going all the way back into March, when an executive at a, at a corporation who sits on the board of ESNT complained about two stories that I'd written. He didn't complain, he, he asked questions. Well, the questions were along the lines of, um, is your journal a liberal journal? Is your journal anti-industry? Um, is this actually journalism or is this just muckraking? Through the spring and into the summer of 2006, editor Alan Newman ran interference for Paul Thacker. Every boss has a different philosophy. And my philosophy was to enable the reporters. And in order for Paul to reach his full potential, he needed to pursue these stories, and I needed to protect him as much as possible. But in August, Newman accepted an early retirement package. He left ES&T 
and Thacker had lost his champion. The folks who took over ESMT told Paul they no longer wanted him to do these type of investigative pieces. And given where Paul's career was going, and given the positive response he had gotten on his pieces, that in fact would have shut down Paul's career. Thacker says the final straw at ESNT came when he was told not to write a story, reporting the White House was stopping government scientists from speaking out about the link between global warming and more intense hurricanes. It involved Thomas Knutson, a scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, NOAA. Knutson had published peer-reviewed studies showing that global warming was increasing the strength of hurricanes. He told the Wall Street Journal he had been prevented from talking about his research on CNBC. I had wanted to get my editors down on the record saying that I couldn't write the story. And they wouldn't write, put it in writing, what had happened. And, they, and, then, and one day when I actually sent an email asking to get a written response that I couldn't write the story, they then pulled me into a room and said, we're not going to give you anything in writing. You can't write the story for us. You can't write it for anyone else. If you want to write the story, you need to go ahead and leave. I said, OK. So I started looking around for a new job, found a great job. And uh, once I found the job, I turned in my two weeks resignation and wrote the story for Salon. A couple of days afterwards, I was pulled into an office. And one of the editors said, well, what's the story? And I said, it's a story I wrote for Salon. It's an excellent story about the White House covering up climate change. And she said, OK, well, <clears throat> you're terminated. For insubordination. I had two days left. <laughs> that tells you everything. The Salon story Thacker says got him fired was based on a batch of government emails he obtained by filing a Freedom of Information Act request. They showed that, as Thacker wrote, the White House was in fact controlling access to scientists and vetting reporters. The evidence? The emails showed that interview requests with scientists from NOAA were vetted by two White House agencies. Thacker also wrote that while Thomas Knutson says he was prevented from going on CNBC, another NOAA scientist with an opposing view, Chris Lancey, was allowed to go on the news hour with Jim Lehrer. When we look at the theory of what global warming suggests hurricanes will change, is that in the order of about 80 years or so, near the end of the 21st century, even if we have, say, a three or four degree Fahrenheit warming of the tropical oceans, we're looking at about a 5% increase in winds and about a 5% overall increase in rainfall. That's a fairly tiny change a long way in the future. Thacker noted that a communications official from the U.S. Department of Commerce, which oversees NOAA, had written an internal email saying, please make sure Chris is on message, and it is a friendly discussion. In September 2006, Paul Thacker began a new job as a reporter for an online education journal called Inside Higher Ed. So now what I'm doing is I'm doing more daily reporting, which, which is kind of nice. Like, I've never really done that before. And I'm working in a whole other area, like writing about education issues. So, Doug, just so that you can kind of understand. So this story, I think, is going to be kind of soft because they're, like, proposing a bill. Given how new Paul is here, we're actually just going to be starting to figure out how to work together. And I think he's got a, a real intellectual curiosity. And that's, to me, that's the fundamental starting point is... Uh, wanting to ask good questions. It was Thacker's curiosity and questioning that led him to become an investigative reporter. And in 2006, for his package of stories that ran in ES&T, exposing industry front groups, product defense strategies, and so-called junk science, the Society of Environmental Journalists selected Paul Thacker as a finalist for their online award. 20 years from now, corporations will still be creating front groups they're still going to be um, attacking scientists for publishing results that they don't like. They're still going to be spending money to buy off congressmen. That's not going to change. I mean, this, this, is, this is going to be an old story 20 years from now.
For more information about Exposé, America's investigative reports, and to watch episodes online, please visit pbs.org. Expose has been provided by 